Hello. In Unit 3 of our course, we traced out a story of the nature of light. And that was a fine story. In this unit, we will start by tracing out the story of what everything in the universe is made of. Now, have you ever wondered? We have so many different things around us. The stars, the planets, the earth, the rock, the minerals, the water, humans, and so many things around us. Have you ever thought of what are these things made of? In fact, this question has been asked by people from very ancient times. People were really wondering what are we all made of? What is the basic constituent of matter? Now, we are going to trace out the story of that and see if we can answer that question satisfactorily. Well, do we have anything to go by? In the 5th century BC, a philosopher called Leucippus suggested that all matter, that is everything including us, are made up of few simple building blocks. Just like a building is constructed by bricks, everything around us is made up of a few building blocks. Now, he managed to convince people, including Democritus, who was the leading philosopher at that time, who believed that matter was made up of small particles, so, so small that they cannot be further subdivided. Well, that is a good suggestion, is that right? Now, Democritus postulated that different substances has different properties because of the differences in the nature of these small particles with which they are made of, or he called them atoms. So the smallest particle that cannot be subdivided is called an atom. And Democritus suggested that different particles behave differently. Water, iron, copper, gold, all these things behave differently. He suggested that the atoms, the fundamental particles which make up these materials may be different. However, his theories were not accepted by Aristotle. You know, Aristotle was a very respectable philosopher of 300 BC. Now, what did Aristotle thought? Aristotle thought that all matter was continuous, that matter is continuous, you can keep on dividing it. In other words, he said there is no basic particle which cannot be subdivided further. Is that right? Aristotle said matter is continuous, you can divide it and divide it and divide it until the end of days, whatever that is. And not discrete. Well, he advocated that every object on the earth was made up of some combinations of only four substances. Now, this is the Aristotelian philosophy. He said, everything on the earth, well, of course, those days, earth was the only prominent object that we could talk about. It's made up of earth, water, fire, and air. Well, it took over 2,000 years for Aristotle's philosophy to be replaced by the concept that matter was not just composed of any of those general substances, but it is comprised of many unique elements. Now, we now know that everything that we have around is made up of some basic elements like hydrogen, carbon, 
oxygen, sulfur, etc. There are well over a hundred elements that make up the substances that we see around us. Well, now here comes the postulate made up by Dalton. Dalton's atomic theory. Now, remember, we are going to trace out the story of the development of the atomic theory, which took centuries to develop and took hundreds and thousands of scientists and wrote hundreds and thousands of books on it. And we are going to do it all in about two hours. All right. So I'm going to abridge that story and I will make that story as comprehensive as possible. So I want you to follow through with me. In the early 1800s, the English chemist John Dalton revived the idea of the atom. Well, to him, the idea of the atom looked good. And he summarized his theories in five statements. Let's look at those statements. What did he say? Dalton said in his statement one, indivisible minute particle called atoms make up all matter. So here he brought back the idea of indivisible basic particle that make up all matter. His st second statement said, all the atoms of an element are exactly the same. If you take an element like aluminum, all the atoms of aluminum are exactly the same. All the atoms of hydrogen are exactly the same. All the atoms of oxygen are exactly the same. Well, that is a good step forward. And his third statement said, the atoms of different elements differ from one another in their mass. In other words, if one atom is small, another atom may be more massive. So atoms of different elements will differ in their mass. And his fourth statement said, atoms chemically combine in definite whole number ratios to form chemical compounds. Well, that is a big statement. That actually advanced the understanding of chemistry and physics a lot. Atoms chemically combine in definite whole number ratios. Now, you know, most people call water H2O. What does that mean? It means two parts of hydrogen combined with one part of oxygen or two hydrogen atoms will combine with one oxygen atom to produce one part of water. You see, atoms chemically combine in definite whole number ratios. Hydrogen to oxygen in water is two to one. All right. His fifth statement said, atoms are neither created not destroyed in chemical reactions. He said chemical reactions are simply exchanging one atom from one group to another and not destroying or creating. Chemical reactions do not create atoms or destroy them, but simply rearrange them to produce one new substance from existing substances. Now, many scientists at that time were skeptical about these suggestions because atoms could not be observed directly. You see, if, people, if you want people to believe anything, the best way to make people believe is to make them see things. You see, in this course, I have been trying my best to make you see things, to show you demonstrations. You see, that is the most important characteristics of science. You see, learning by actually seeing. So most people were skeptical about the atomic theory brought forward by Dalton because these atoms could not be seen. 
It was so small. <coughs> the discovery of electron by J.J. Thomson changed all this. So if we now talked about the first chapter of the atomic theory, the second chapter of the story is going to start with the work done by a very eminent physicist called J.J. Thomson. Now, what did J.J. Thomson do? J.J. Thomson is the one who discovered the small particles called electrons. Now, how did he discover it? I'm going to take five minutes maybe to talk about it. Now, this is J.J. Thomson. At the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge University in England, Thomson was experimenting with electric current inside evacuated glass tube. Now, let me see if I can show you the kind of, here I have an evacuated glass tube. I hope you can see this. I'm going to keep it right in front of the camera. Now, this is a glass tube that is evacuated and an electric current is allowed to pass from this end to here. In fact, this is vacuum. So, you connect this tube one end to the positive of a power supply and the other to the negative of the power supply. And what Thompson noticed was a glow inside or electric discharge. Didn't we talk about electric discharge being the cause of production of light? Now, this is the experiment that Thompson did and many, many discoveries were actually made from this electric discharge that Thomson started working with. So Thomson was experimenting with electric current inside evacuated glass tube. Now, this is the original glass tube he actually used. And if you look at this, electricity is connected to both ends of the tube. You know that electricity has a positive end and a negative end. If you look at your car battery, it has a positive end and a negative end. If you connect the two together, there will be a great explosion. Well, the positive is connected here and the negative is connected here. All right. Now, what Thompson noticed, and you see inside the tube a glow going from the negative end. Actually, the negative end is called the cathode and the positive end is called the anode. You don't need to worry about these names. So, Thompson noticed the glow from the cathode to the anode. Well, you see, when a scientist notices something new, they want to discover more about it. What is it? Can we find out something more about it? Now, he discovered a mysterious radiation emanating from the negative end of the tube, that mysterious radiation that nobody has seen before is emanating from the negative end of the tube. So he spent a lot of time studying it. Now, he suggested that these mysterious rays are actually streams of particles. And uh, he allowed these mysterious particles to fall on what he called fluorescent screens. And he noticed that when they fell on the screens, they produced flashes. Each time something falls, you see a flash. So he concluded that these streams of particles are very small and very light particles much smaller than an atom, particles that belong to the atom. So, this is the first time anybody has come forward and suggested that atom is breakable. In fact, an atom is no longer the fundamental uh, building block of materials, but atom is made up of constituent particles. So Thompson suggested that 
this glow or this radiation is actually small particles. And where are these small particles coming from? He said these small particles are coming from the atoms that make up the cathode, the negative electrode of that tube. All right. Well, now how do a scientific idea get respectability? When other people pr perform the same experiment and observe the same result. Now, Thomson called these particles corpuscles and suggested that they might be the constituents of atoms. Well, he didn't put forward any theory. He suggested that these may be particles that make up the atoms, the small particles of the matter. Now, later experiments showed that, well, when I tried to summarize this one sentence, this is the work of several years by J.J. Thompson and his collaborators. So, later experiments showed that these are negatively charged particles. In fact, these particles carry a negative electric charge and these particles were subsequently called electrons. And it was observed that they are indeed part of the constitution of all matter. You know how Thomson arrived at that conclusion? He used many substances as the negative electrode. And he observed that all these substances resulted in this same radiation. So what is the conclusion? The conclusion is that these minute particles, which are now called electrons, are make up the constitution of all matter. That means if an atom is the basic part of all substances, then this atom contains these electrons. So atom is no longer the basic constituent. An atom can be broken into smaller pieces. Now studies by an American physicist, Robert Millikan. Now Millikan did a lot of studies on these mysterious rays. Now he measured the mass, he measured the electric charge. You see, a lot of experiments was conducted by Millikan. Now he measured the charge of these electrons and he found that they carry an electric charge of 1.6 times 10 to the negative Coulomb. And each of these particles has a mass of 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilogram. How small is it? It's a very, very, very small mass. You can't even imagine such. It's a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth kilogram. So small. All right. Now here comes J.J. Thompson with a model of the atom. So J.J. Thompson said, okay, let's make a picture of the atom. What is an atom? which is the smallest part of a substance. So, let's see what J.G. Thompson said. One of the first atomic models was that proposed by J.J. Thompson after he discovered the electrons as a result of his work with the mysterious rays. In fact, those mysterious rays were called cathode rays. You know why they were called cathode rays? Because these were radiations coming from the cathode going towards the anode. Well, since each atom was electrically neutral, well, you see an atom as a whole does not carry an electric charge. Well, that means if an atom has to contain a negatively charged electron, then that atom must also contain some positive charge. Then only an atom can be electrically neutral. All atoms have to be electrically neutral because you are electrically neutral, I am electrically neutral, 
the my aluminum rod you are now familiar with this uh, very much you have been seeing this for how many days now this is electrically neutral my remote control is electrically neutral that means the atoms with which all these are made of are electrically neutral what does that mean it must contain equal amounts of negative and positive charges only equal amounts of negative and positive charges will make a substance neutral so since each atom was electrically neutral Thomson thought that it consisted of a relatively large uniformly distributed positive mass so this is the picture the of the atom Thomson proposed he said an atom is a relatively large positively charged mass and these electrons are sort of distributed inside this mass a beautiful picture look at the Thomson's picture of the atom he said the atom is a body is a positively charged body and inside that atom these negatively charged electrons are embedded and uh, you know what the model of the atom was called it was called the plum pudding model of the atom in other words the model he proposed was like a pudding the pudding is the atom the positively charged atom and the plums are the negatively charged electrons so that the atom as a whole is electrically neutral now, Thomson's careful experiments and adventurous hypotheses were followed by crucial experimental and theoretical work by many others in the United States, Germany, France, and elsewhere. Now, remember, a scientific discovery does not become a theory or a law until it has been experimented and results consistent results has been observed by people working on the subject all over the world then only a scientific principle will receive respectability so people from all over the world worked on this and we will now look at the result and that is the story of this lesson now these physicists opened us a new perspective a view from inside the atom so our story actually unwheels into looking into the atom a view from inside the atom and it is JJ Thompson who started that so this is the first picture of the atom that anybody ever knew well here comes another picture of the atom and that is given by Rutherford a very famous scientist who worked in the 19th century in England in fact he was so famous that there is a research laboratory in England in his name and I was fortunate enough to work in that lab for about two years now a lot of work on atoms and the structure of the atoms the structure of elementary particles are all worked out in that lab well what did Rutherford do let me take you through an experiment that he did in 1909 Rutherford arranged a sample of polonium you see before the advent of the structure the study of the structure of atom it was known that some materials emit deadly radiations polonium is a radioactive material and it was known that if you have a sample of polonium in a box like this a deadly radiations like alpha particles alpha particles are actually made up of minute atoms in fact the substance polonium will emit these alpha particles with a tremendous velocity now 
If you now want to know what an atom is made of, you know what scientists do when you want to know what an atom is made of? Well, what they do is keep a substance over there and bombard it with bullets. All right? Now, what kind of bullets are they going to use to smash an atom? An atom is a very small object. So, if you want to smash or hit an atom, you need to use bullets that are very small. You can't use the kind of bullets we use in our guns. And now, this alpha particle that is given off by this radioactive material polonium is a very, very suitable bullet. So what Rutherford did is, he used a sample of polonium which gives off these alpha particles. They are the bullets. And he aimed these bullets at a very thin foil of gold so that these alpha particles could go and bombard atoms of gold. You see? And then he could find out the result of this bombardment. Now, this is what he did. This is the polonium sample which gives off the alpha particles. And this is the gold foil. And he kept a screen. You know a screen? I told you about zinc sulfide, a, a fluorescent material. Now, here, if you keep that fluorescent material here, any alpha particles that hit the gold, if it escapes the gold foil, you can detect it. Anytime an alpha particle falls on a fluorescent screen, it will produce a, a light, a flash. So when you see a flash, you know an alpha particle has hit it. So this is called the detector, the screen. So once again, look, the, look at the arrangement he made. This is the gun, the polonium sample from where alpha particles are released. So the alpha particles are the bullets and the gold foil is the target. Now, after hitting the gold atoms, these alpha particles were detected on the screen. And now, what did he actually observe? So the foil was surrounded by a luminescent zinc sulfide screen to detect where the alpha particles emerged after contacting the gold atoms. After hitting the gold atoms, where did these alpha particles go? That was his concern. Now, Rutherford observed many of the alpha particles went through the gold foil without suffering much deviation. Now, you would expect that when a bullet hits something, it will suffer deviations. Is that right? That's right. Now, what Rutherford observed is that these alpha particles, most of them, didn't even know that they were going through the gold foil. They went through straight. But some of them showed some deviations. Now, Rutherford said it was almost as incredible as if you fired a 15. Now, what, what happened is, before I talk about this sentence, you see, most of the alpha particles went through the gold foil without any deviation. But he observed that once in a while, an alpha particle bounced back, almost got reflected backward. That is something very strange. You see, the only way a particle that is going forward can bounce back is that it hits something very hard. Is that right? If you hit something very soft, it will go through it without having much deviation. The only way it can deflect or deviate or to, to bounce back is that it hits something really hard. So, this observation prompted Rutherford to say, this is his own sentence, it was almost as incredible as if you find a 15-inch shell at a piece of tissue paper 
and it came back and hit you. Oh well, can you imagine that happened? Now, he fired these alpha particles on a very thin gold foil. And some of these alpha particles bounced back. Now, it looked like as though you fired a big cannonball onto a tissue paper and it bounced back. Well, this is actually what happened. Suppose these are the gold atoms. Right? Most of the alpha particles did not show any deviation. They just went through the gold foil. Now, what does that suggest? That suggests that atoms of any substance are mostly made up of free space. An atom, most of an atom is really empty space. And that is the reason why these alpha particles did not encounter any obstacle. Most of them simply went through without any deviation. But once in a while, look at this, once in a while, one alpha particle got thrown back, almost thrown back. The only way that can happen is this alpha particle encountered something really hard. Now, let me see if I can show you a, an animation of uh, this. Give me a second. Now, this is the gold foil. Can you see the gold foil there? Well, of course, it's been made very thick. And this is where the alpha particles are fired from the polonium samples. You can see the alpha particles going with tremendous speed and going through the gold atoms. And here is the zinc sulfide screen where the alpha particles can be detected. And if you notice, most of these alpha particles are going through the gold foil without suffering any deviation at all. But watch, once in a while, can you, once in a while, some of them encounters something very hard and gets deflected almost they are thrown back and Rutherford was more interested in this behavior he was not interested in the normal behavior that the alpha particles went through but he was interested in the behavior of some of these that showed great deflection if you notice there are varying degrees of deflection that you notice there. But some of them were very rare, encountered a very hard part of the atom, which then made it completely go back. Okay, so what does that mean? Now, Rutherford argued that the atom has a positive core. Now, Rutherford said, Unlike what Thomson suggested, Thomson suggested that the positive part is all distributed in a great mass and the negative electrons are distributed. Now Rutherford said, no, that is not possible. My experiment doesn't show that to me. He said the positive part of the atom actually form a central core of the atom. In fact, that is the hard part. It's a very small part, but it is very hard. So, uh, Rutherford argued that the, the atom has a positive core, and he called that the nucleus. So, this dark dot that is here is the positive part, that is the nucleus. And when an alpha particle encounters that, it is then that the alpha particle is bounced almost back. So the nucleus, therefore, is a very hard part. And that means most of the mass of the atom is concentrated at the nucleus. You see? And most of the other parts of the atom is empty space. So, once again, what did, what did Rutherford say? He argued that the atom has a positive core called the nucleus, which is responsible for the diffraction of the alpha particles in that particular way. 
Now, this is what happened. If this is the nucleus, an alpha particle coming towards the nucleus suffers a considerable deviation. Now, apparently, alpha particles also carry a positive charge. So, when the alpha particles come towards the positive nucleus, the electrical repulsion just throws them away. Now, soon he came up with a new atomic model based on the results of this experiment. So, we are now going to look at the atom model put forward by Rutherford based on his famous gold foil experiment. I would like you to remember some of the details of these experiments. So, what is the Rutherford's model of the atom? He published his atomic theory, describing the atom as having a central positive nucleus, and then he said the electrons actually, go, uh, the electrons are actually surrounding the nucleus in what are called orbits. Now, this is the model of uh, Rutherford. He said the nucleus is concentrated at the center and the nucleus carries a positive electric charge. So, the positive charge of the atom is concentrated at the center. It is called the nucleus. And most of the mass of the atom is actually concentrated at the nucleus. The negatively charged electrons move around that nucleus in orbits. And that is the picture of the atom Rutherford. Now this is what Rutherford said. The positive nucleus and the electrons, the negatively charged electrons are moving around it in orbits. The amount of positive charge in the nucleus equal to the amount of negative charge carried by the electrons. So, that looks pretty good. Is that right? Okay. Now, later, when Rutherford bombarded nitrogen with alpha particles. Now, remember I told you, the best way to study an atom is to try and break it open. In other words, uh, fire a bullet into the atom. Rutherford did not stop with his gold foil experiment. He continued with many more of his novel way to probe into the atom. Now, he bombarded atoms with nitrogen, with nitrogen atoms. Well, he bombarded nitrogen atoms with alpha particles. And he observed that the positively charged nucleus is actually made up of particles. A nucleus is not a single body. He observed that you can break the nucleus into pieces. And he said the nucleus is actually made up of protons, which are positively charged particles. Now, here you have uh, protons. I have uh, showed them using red color. Uh, they are protons. So, according to Rutherford's model, the nucleus of the atom is made up of protons. Now, later on, actually Rutherford did not discover this. He suggested to one of his assistants who was working in the lab that he said, now I have a, I have a hunch that the nucleus also contains some other particles because the mass of the nucleus suggests that it is not just made of protons alone. It must contain some other particles. Now, Chadwick, that was his assistant's name, took up this challenge and he started working on it. And ultimately, in 1935, Chadwick discovered that the nucleus also contains another type of particles which are not electrically charged. They are neutral particles. And he called them neutrons. So look at the way the picture of the atom now emerges. The nucleus of the atom is now understood to be made up of 
positively charged protons and electrically neutral neutrons. So you got protons and neutrons. So the mass of the nucleus is made up of the mass of protons and neutrons. The electric charge of the nucleus is made up of the charge carried by protons, which are positive. All right. Now, protons have a mass of 1.673 times 10 to the negative 27 kilogram. In fact, protons are almost 2,000 times more massive than electrons. So compared with protons, electrons are very light. However, protons could not be the only particles in the nucleus because the number of protons in any given element weight has a mass less than the weight of the nucleus. Well, that's what I was telling you. The mass of the nucleus suggests that protons are not the only particles in the nucleus. So, he argued that a third neutrally charged particle must exist. Rutherford made that argument, but he did not discover that particle. The credit for discovering that particle went to his assistant Chadwick, who was given a Nobel Prize for it in 1935. So, it was James Chadwick, a British physicist and a co-worker of Rutherford, in fact, it's not good to say a co-worker, he was an assistant working in the lab who discovered the third subatomic, subatomic particle, which is the neutron. So what are the type of subatomic particles we know so far? An atom has now a nucleus. The nucleus contains protons that are positively charged, neutrons that are electrically neutral, and of course, outside, you have electrons that are negatively charged. And neutrons have a mass of 1.675 times 10 to the negative 27 kilogram. So if you notice, the mass of a neutron is almost the same as the mass of a proton. You can see a neutron is slightly more heavier in fact, later on, we will talk about this. A neutron actually can be, don't tell this to anybody, a neutron can be broken down into a proton and an electron. All right, keep this with you. We will talk about this in the next lesson. A neutron can be broken down into a proton and an electron. How amazing these particles are. Now, the nuclear model of the atom developed by Rutherford suggests that most of the atom consists of empty space. The nucleus is concentrated at the center of the core, and the electrons are so tiny, they just go around the nucleus, and much of the atom is actually empty space. And that's the reason why Many, many, many of the alpha particles that Rutherford used as bullets went through the gold foil without even knowing that they were going through a material. Most of the atom is actually empty space. Now, if you, now, if the nucleus of an atom, now this is the nucleus of, say, gold, if the nucleus of the atom and the sun are represented by the radius of uh, by the radius of 30 centimeter in fact if you increase the size of a gold nucleus so that it is now 30 centimeters in diameter and you decrease the diameter of the sun and bring it down to 30 centimeter here is the sun and here is the gold nucleus. If both are made of the same size, you know, looking at the solar system, where will our Earth be? How far will our Earth be? 
see, this is 30 centimeter. Our Earth will simply be a hundred meters from the Sun in that scale. And in the same scale, when this is the, the nucleus, the first electron will be five kilometers away. You see that? If you bring down the solar system and a gold atom to the same scale, when the, sun, when the Earth is 100 meters from the Sun, the first electron will be 5 kilometers from the nucleus. You can imagine the enormity of the empty space that an atom is. All right. Now the nucleus is now understood to be, let's now consolidate the atomic theory proposed by Rutherford. What do we know? The nucleus is now understood to be composed of protons and neutrons, particles of nearly equal mass. You can see I use protons red and neutrons green. This is the nucleus that consists of protons that are positively charged, neutrons that are electrically neutral, and they coexist making up the nucleus. Protons and neutrons together are called nucleons. Nucleons are nuclear particles, right? The number of protons and no neutrons together is the number of nucleons. Now, elements differ in the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus of their atoms. Well, and that is the difference in the elements. Now, the simplest element is hydrogen. We will talk a lot about hydrogen as we go on in today's lesson. The simplest element is hydrogen. The nucleus of hydrogen contains just one proton. The ordinary hydrogen contains just one proton. And one electron going around it. That is the hydrogen atom, the simplest atom. So you must have a picture of the hydrogen atom in your mind. Just one proton and an electron around it is our hydrogen atom. An element is identified, I want you to remember this. An element is identified by its atomic number. And represent the atomic number by the letter Z. And the mass number. Mass number is identified by the letter uppercase A. So, an element is identified by its atomic number, which is Z, and mass number, that is uppercase A. Now, what is the atomic number? Atomic number of an element is the number of protons in the nucleus. The number of protons in the nucleus. So tell me, what is the atomic number of hydrogen? Hydrogen has one proton in the nucleus, therefore its atomic number is one. All right. A is the sum of the protons and neutrons. Mass number is the sum of the protons and the neutrons. All right, tell me in that case, what is the mass number of hydrogen? Mass number of hydrogen also is one because it has no neutrons. So the mass number of hydrogen is one. The atomic number also is one. Now if n is the number of neutrons in the nucleus, then the number of neutrons will be the mass number minus the atomic number. You see, if the mass number of an element is 22 and the atomic number is 10. What does that mean? Let me ask you this. If the mass number is 22, that means A equal to 22 and the atomic number is 10. Well, remember, the atomic number is the number of protons. There are 10 protons. And the mass number is the number of protons and neutrons. So if you add the number of protons, that is 10, 
to the number of neutrons you get 22 so what is the number of neutrons the number of neutrons is the mass number that is 22 minus the atomic number now in this case that will be 12 okay the nucleus symbol now every element is represented by a nuclear symbol every element has a symbol and in, in this case I'm simply going to use X now what are some of the symbols do you know some of the symbols all right let me show you some of the symbols we will talk about that as we go on now hydrogen is H so H stands for hydrogen H E stands for helium now some common elements F E stands for iron now we talked about gold gold is A sub G you see that is gold now C L stands for chlorine C stands for carbon well, we will come across all these elements as we go on into the two or three lessons from today. So, every element has, is identified by a chemical symbol. So, if I use X here, that X will be replaced by these when we talk about each of these elements. So, the symbol of the element an element is identified by its symbol, then its atomic number, and its mass number. These are the three things that we use to identify an element. Now look at the way an element is written. This is the symbol of the element. The atomic number is written at the left bottom corner. The mass number is written at the left top corner. This is the normal way to write, uh, to represent an element. So X, Z, A. X stands for the symbol of the element. Z is the atomic number, which is the number of protons in the nucleus. And A is the mass number, that is the number of protons and neutrons. For example, lithium. Lithium is an element and the nucleus of that element contains three protons and four neutrons. All right, lithium, Li is the symbol. Z is the number of protons, that is three. A is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons, that is three plus four, seven. So how will we represent lithium? Look at the way. Li37. This is the way we represent lithium. Can you now write in one of the papers that is in front of you? The symbol for hydrogen. How do we represent hydrogen? All right, have you written? The atomic number is one, mass number is one. So ordinary hydrogen. Hydrogen can be of different types. The, but this is the ordinary hydrogen H11 one, one. one proton and no neutron so atomic mass is simply the number of protons all right now this is the ordinary hydrogen soon we will see there are different types of hydrogen we will look at that as we go on well this is the time to look at those isotopes. Now, an isotope, an element, you see the nucleus of an element can contain some protons and some neutrons. Is that right? Now, it is the number of protons that identify the elements. Now, there may be other forms of the same element, that is, Atoms of the same element. Now, how do you know they are of the same element? 
because of the same atomic number. The number of protons will identify the element. For example, if the nucleus contains six protons, irrespective of the number of neutrons, that nucleus belongs to carbon. Carbon has six protons. You see? So, if the neutrons are different, then you have different kinds of carbon. So, atoms of the same element can have different numbers of neutrons. Right? Now, that doesn't make an element different. The, it is the same element, as long as the number of protons are the same, the element is the same element. But different forms are the same element. Different possible versions of each element are called isotopes. So isotopes of an element are different versions of the same element. Means the nucleus will contain the same number of protons, but different numbers of neutrons. Now, for example, the most common isotope of hydrogen has no neutrons at all. We talked about it. There is also a hydrogen isotope called deuterium with one neutron. There is a form of hydrogen that contains one proton and one neutron. And if there is another form of hydrogen that contains one proton and two neutrons. Now, this is the ordinary hydrogen. It contains just one proton. And that is H11. You see? One proton and no neutron. And most of the hydrogen in the universe is this. But you can have a different type of hydrogen. One proton and one neutron. This is still hydrogen. Why? Because the number of protons is just one. How do you write the symbol for this? It will be H12. One proton and one neutron. Remember this number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. One plus one equal to two. Now this isotope of hydrogen is called, what is it called? Deuterium. Deuterium. In fact, when you produce water using this particular hydrogen, it's called heavy water. Heavy water because we are using hydrogen that is heavier than normal hydrogen. And look at the third isotope of hydrogen. It's got one proton. As long as the number of protons is the same, it is hydrogen. It has one proton and two neutrons. And look at the way it's written. H13, one proton and two neutron. The mass number is one plus two. Well, there are preferred combinations of neutrons and protons at which the forces holding the nuclei together seem to balance best. Now, the question is, can we put any number of neutrons in the nucleus? But the question is no. In order that a nucleus may be stable, there is a preferred number of neutrons and protons. And that is, that's the reason why the ordinary hydrogen, which is the most abundant hydrogen, is just one proton. Now, life elements tend to have about as many neutrons as their protons. So if you look at elements that are light, that means atomic numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and so on, they tend to have almost as many neutrons as there are protons. The number of neutrons will be equal to the number of protons in the nucleus. But as the elements become bigger, heavier and heavier, in order to keep the nucleus together, you need a larger number of neutrons. So atoms with too many neutrons are not quite enough.
can sometimes exist for a while, but they are unstable. You see, if, an, if a nucleus contains far too many neutrons, or far too less, we will say such a nucleus is unstable, and such a nucleus will simply disintegrate. It is materials like that we call radioactive materials. You see, that is not to say that elements can't have more than one stable isotope. There are. Now, ordinary hydrogen and deuterium are both stable, and you can see um, tin has 10 stable isotopes. You see, tin comes in 10 different forms. In other words, the nucleus can have 10 different combinations of protons and neutrons. All elements beyond the bismuth, that is atomic number 83, are unstable. So, any element that is above atomic number 83 is unstable and they will be radioactive and they will disintegrate. If the combinations of protons and neutrons in a nucleus is not conducive to stability, then we say that nucleus is unstable. Now, as I told you, any nucleus above atomic number 83, that is bismuth, is that right? Any nucleus that has an atomic number greater than 83 is unstable. The combinations of neutrons and protons does not allow a conducive living together or uh, the stability of the nucleus is affected. We say such atoms are radioactive. What is the meaning of radioactivity? Such nuclei will throw away nuclear particles and energy. You see? And these nuclear particles and energy that are thrown away by these radioactive materials are pretty harmful. Now, these materials are called radioactive materials. We will talk more about them in our next lesson. All right. So their nuclei change or decay by spitting out radiation in the form of particles or electromagnetic waves. So what they throw out may be particles or electromagnetic wave. Well, a better understanding of this will be gained in the next lesson. Here are some of the elements that we find around us. And if you click on one of them, the table will tell you if it is stable or unstable. If it is unstable, it will show you what happens. So here I have clicked on hydrogen, H1. That is stable, just one proton. <clears throat> now, let's click on one, some of these and see what happens. Now, this is carbon-14, look at this, it became nitrogen-14, and is it stable? Well, if it is not stable, it will throw away something more. Now, says nitrogen-14 is stable. Let's look at uh, some other element. Now, this is unstable carbon-15, there it radiated, became nitrogen-15. And look maybe at oxygen 17, that is stable, it will not throw away anything. Let's see if this will throw away anything, nitrogen 17, there you go. You see, look at what a, an unstable nucleus does. So, if a nucleus is unstable, it wants to achieve stability. And now, how, do, how, how does it achieve stability? by throwing away nuclear particles and energy. Okay. And this process is called radioactivity. We will talk more about it later on. There are three types of radiations emitted by a radioactive isotope. 
They are called alpha, beta and gamma radiations. In fact, Rutherford used these alpha radiations to bombard the gold foil. So even before the Rutherford experiment, the existence of these radiations were known. Alpha and beta are particles. In fact, this alpha is made up of two protons and two neutrons. So if a nucleus is too massive, it can throw away chunks of it. Two protons and two neutrons is an alpha particle. When it goes away, well, it, it could create stability. If it doesn't create stability, it will throw away more particles until the nucleus becomes stable. So alpha and beta are particles, while gamma radiations are electromagnetic waves of great energy. All right. Now, Rutherford model of the atom, is this a perfect model of the atom? Have we struck gold here? Do we know what atoms are? Well, no. This is only the beginning. There are problems with Rutherford model of the atom. You see, any model of the atom must explain the behavior of elements. Now, we know how hydrogen behave, how uh, lithium behave, how helium behave. Some of the behaviors of these elements need to be explained by using the model of the atom. Now, Rutherford model actually failed in explaining many of the observed phenomena. But most of all, Rutherford's model failed because of a particular phenomenon. According to Maxwell's law of electromagnetic radiation, an accelerating electric charge should radiate energy. Now, if you look at the Rutherford model, what does the Rutherford model tell you? It tells you that an atom consists of a nucleus with electrons going round it in circles. Now, if you remember, we did talk about motion in circles. We said an object moving in a circle is continuously accelerating. Do you remember that one? And we call that acceleration centripetal acceleration. So an electron going around the nucleus in circles are actually accelerating continuously. And according to Maxwell's law, if an electron is accelerating, it should radiate energy. So uh, a, an electron that is accelerating, if it's radiate energy, then it must continuously lose energy and ultimately, if it loses energy, what will happen? It will fall onto the nucleus. You see, why is the moon going around the earth? Because the moon has a certain energy. It has a motion. Now, what happens all of a sudden if the moon stops moving? It will simply fall into the earth. In the same way, an electron moving around the nucleus if it loses energy continuously, it will spiral and spiral and spiral and it will hit the nucleus. That means Rutherford model of the atom is not stable. An atom, like Rutherford says, cannot exist because electrons cannot continuously go around the nucleus without losing energy. And when they lose energy, they will fall into the nucleus. That means there is no more atom. An electron in orbit is an accelerating electric charge and it should lose energy and ultimately fall in the nucleus. So these electrons are accelerating and according to the Maxwell's theory, they must lose energy and ultimately the atom must collapse. So Rutherford's model is a failure because of this. Now, since this does not happen, well, if all atoms collapsed like this, then there will be no universe. There will be no matter. 
No substances, no elements. See? So we know that this does not happen. And since this, this does not happen, what is the conclusion? The model of the atom proposed by Rutherford is not correct. So there is significant problem with Rutherford model of the atom. Well, that really doesn't mean we need to discard it. What we need to do is to improve it. So we are now going to look at how we improve it. Now, a Danish physicist Bohr tried to solve this problem by linking familiar phenomena to atomic models. You see, once you take our familiar phenomena and try to explain it using the atom model, we can improve the atom model. And so, we're going to now look at the model of the atom proposed by Niels Bohr, and I will do that in the second part of the lesson. All right?